So just to um, resume here, the first is I'm pretty sure from what I've seen that most of you are making great project, uh, uh, great progress on your projects. Is that generally the sense? Yeah. So there's a week left. Um, the tutorials are all over. In fact, the, there's no more group tutorials. All of that is finished. So that um, time that you would have spent after the tutorial working on the next assignment now is free for you to be using for your project. And so that should be something that your group is focusing on over the next few days. The other um, point, uh, there was the indication that sometimes I cancel lectures in this last week of term to give you a bit of free time. However, there are a few topics that I need to cover still and there's only four lectures remaining. So I'm not canceling any classes. But um, the assignment load is obviously gone away and that's um, intentional. And the other thing is your group is now at a point after eight weeks of working together so intensively, should be comfortable and have figured out how to work with each other to achieve the goals that you need to. Um, the next thing is also about the assignments, right? And tying it in a little bit with what the uh, guest lecturer mentioned in class on Wednesday, that idea of front-end loading, right? The assignments have essentially been doing that. They've been building up all the topics, all the work, and pretty much once you submit your project, there's nothing for the next three weeks, right? And then I'll see you on the 13th for the exam. So we're, we, we do a lot of the work at the front and get things right so that later on it's a little easier. Um, by the way, how was the guest lecture on Wednesday? Was it insightful? It was insightful for maybe for a bit of time to be able to lectures. Okay. So like it was hard to ask questions that were needed to finish the content. Right, so there's a bit too much content. That's the standard um, issue that any time someone lectures for the first time makes. Um, and so that was his first time ever in front of a classroom. So he, he was pretty intimidated, but um, I thought he did well in general. So it was good, good content. Um, what you heard there, I had a chance to chat with him for about an hour before the class over coffee. And uh, it was interesting. He spoke about FEL1, FEL2, FEL3. So in um, your project, which, which ones of those are you in? One, two, three. Okay, if you're finding it hard to place yourself, that's intentional. You're a little bit everywhere. In terms of costing, you're definitely in FEL1, right? FEL2, you've got a far detailed level of cost estimates. Remember, FEL2 is where they, they go to vendors and they start getting formalized quotes. Um, in terms of the piping and instrumentation diagram and looking at safety and troubleshooting, you're probably somewhere at FEL2, right? So we're, not, we're, we're fairly f uh, further on from the conceptual stage. And that's because the way we do it in an academic environment, I can't, we can't just work on FEL1 and then move to two and then three. It would be pretty artificial with that um, way of learning things. So that's, that's an intentional um, aspect of the project is that I, we're focusing on all sorts of angles there. And it's not going to be quite the same as you experience it in practice. But you're seeing a little bit of everything, which is great. The other comment he made was um, that factor of three Right, as a sanity check that they use on their cost estimates. Where, what does that remind you of? Right, they said they take the cost of the equipment and they multiply it by three and that should get them the total cost of, the, of everything installed and running and commissioned and started up. It's the bare module factor, right? So we were chatting ahead of time and I was telling him how we, we look at costing and I mentioned the bare module factor and he's like, yeah, we use a number three. And I was like, okay, our, if you look at the bare module factors in Woods' textbook, they range between 2.5 and 3.5. And he said they have bare module ranges as well for different units. Um, so that's, that's an intentional sanity check and it matches with what we've been learning. And the other interesting thing, he mentioned it but didn't kind of emphasize it, but they have um, in FEL3, their tolerances are plus or minus 2% on their error, okay? And they're held to that. They cannot exceed it. Once they commit to a project and they put the budget in and they get it approved, that's what they have to deliver. Okay, so, um, so that's the level of, of accuracy that they get at to that, in that final stage. Okay, so I thought that was a great overview and I'm glad that uh, Leo had a chance to come speak with us. Let's resume uh, what we were looking at over the last few classes. Um, 
we've essentially been looking at the six layers. And um, I'll just leave it up here in the corner. We'll refer to it periodically. The basic process control system. And then an alarm gets raised if, if the controller can't eliminate the problem. We then go to SIS. And after the SIS stage, we're at the fourth stage we looked at last week. And so BPCS alarms SIS, and then we hit, my mind's just gone blank. <laughs> so I'm going to have to look back here. Ah, uh, relief, of course. OK. And then finally, we reach a stage of containment. And containment isn't literally a container. It could well be that, but it could also be a flare where you're Essentially, you're containing the problem by destroying the chemical and flaring it and burning it out. So your final stage is containment up there. And then the sixth stage is the emergency response. Um, and we learned about that in the assignment with the Seveso Directive. So Seveso Directive 1, 2, and, it's, and the third directive is about to come through in the European Union. So that was a bit of last week's. In this week, um, I'm moving on to the next topic of hazard and operability studies. And I'd like to just give a little bit of um, commentary on that initially. So when we look at hazards, we see them as evolving into accidents. So we'll start with a hazard. And a hazard is defined in your course slides. Um, if you have them there in front of you, I'll just bring it up here. Um, right on the first slide, there's this sort of list, uh, slide five of hazards, risks, incidents, accidents. So a hazard then is the idea that you can have a characteristic. It's something that's inherent in the process, a characteristic that can lead to unsafe conditions. Okay, and at the bottom of slide five here, you can't see it so clearly, but the hazard leads to an incident, and an incident leads to an accident. So let's just look a little bit more about, at that. So there's this hazard, and what we get is the hazard can lead to a triggering cause. And the cause results in some deviation from your regular operation, right? So Accidents and incidents only occur because we're operating away from what we normally do. That's the deviation. And then when that deviation gets out of hand, it can go in one of two ways. It forms an incident or an accident. And the line that distinguishes incident from accident is, is very, very blurry and is often just by semantics of who defines um, what. So an incident is also often, you'll see here this term, a near miss. Okay. So let's perhaps put a concrete example on uh, those words there. And I'll have you think through this particular system. So we're working with a reactor. And the reactor has, we've seen this idea before. Let's let, use a pack bed reactor. The reactor has some sort of coils here to cool. So it's an exothermic reaction. And it's um, perhaps put up some kinetics, oh, sorry, uh, equations here for it. So we'll say A goes to B, uh, A plus B goes to 4C plus D. So that's gas phase. Um, and then that. C intermediate gets reacted with more B and goes to D plus E. So these are the products. And it's exothermic. So all of that is exothermic. So I'm just setting up this case study to talk about those terms up there on the left. Now, to get the reactor started, we will have typically um, steam over here, and that's just to just to get going. Okay, so this is just for startup.
And then once you get going, though, because it's exothermic, you need cooling coming in. So regularly it's on coolant, and then you've got steam there just to get started. Okay, now one, one way we can look at this in terms of hazards, causes, deviations, and then an accident versus a near miss is the hazard exists of high pressure. Okay, so that's, there's a hazard of high pressure in this reactor, and that's when we look at hazard and operability studies, we'll be identifying hazards. The outcome of that, whether it's an incident or an accident, it might be that an accident in this case leads to explosion or material venting. Okay, so the material being forced out the reactor because of high pressure. So that there's a hazard of high pressure, we're in an enclosed vessel. It might be that we set up that pressure so fast that that vessel ruptures, or the vessel's pressure increases to such an extent that we're forcing hazardous products out onto people and employees. But how do we get from that hazard to this incident or accident occurring? Well, we need, as shown here, a cause. And the cause, the triggering event might be there's any number of ways this could happen, but the triggering event for the cause might be operation of steam instead of cooling water or coolant. Okay. So somehow that steam valve gets opened and it's more than it's normally shut Steam is opened, and now instead of sending coolant in there only, we're sending steam as well. Accelerating the forward reaction. So the kinetics move in the forward direction. We're converting at a faster rate that intermediate species C. And because we're forming four moles of it there on the, on the one side, we're getting this excess um, gas being formed, leading to a buildup of pressure. So we remember that from reactor design. Right? We, we've got more moles here on the right-hand side than on the left, and so that can build up a pressure in the reactor if that reaction is driven forward. Okay, so that's my cause. The deviation then, there's a, there was a deviation when we do that. Oh, operating the steam instead of the coolant, the deviation is that we have not enough cooling. So we have a certain amount of cooling we normally experience, and now we're achieving a lower amount. We're not achieving zero cooling. We're just, we're just lowering the regular amount of cooling. Okay, now if you look at this hazard, it could be caused here by operation of steam instead of coolant, but it might also, the same sequence of events could have occurred by using a concentration of A that was higher than we normally do. Okay, so same way, same sequence of events just by using a higher concentration of reactants. Okay, and it might not even be the steam being opened, it might simply be the cooling flow rate dropping. So coolant flow drops, and again, the same se sequence of deviations and causes occur. So any number of ways that that same scenario could play out. Okay, so look at that. What, what could you do about it? There's at least five or six different ways to creatively avoid this from occurring. Remember the whole idea with, or not remember, but the idea with hazard and operability studies is that this chain of events from the hazard to the cause to the deviation and accident, we want to break this at any 
possible points. If you can break it along that pathway at any of those three places, you prevent that occurrence. So think about it for a few minutes, some creative ideas, and let's hear them. So take a minute or two, write, write down your ideas, and let's talk about them. Anything, anything that could have helped avoid that accident from occurring. So let's hear some ideas or some discussion and then I'll take up some ideas. Okay, so write down your ideas. Let's, let's hear them in a minute. Okay, some suggestions from some groups. Over there, Samir. So P um, added, so you add a pressure sensor, and then you control, control coolant flow. Okay. Let's presume that that was, that's a good suggestion to have then. It wasn't shown. Let's presume that that was there, in fact. The same scenario could still play out with the pressure sensor there and to control the coolant flow. What could have happened is that that coolant flow is open to try and reduce the pressure, but the steam is still going. Okay, so some other suggestions, Graham? Um, could you have like a manual valve in between where like the steam comes in and the cooling comes in um, for like only startup purposes? So it's only open when you're starting it up and then it's closed when you convert the valve to your operation. Okay, so this, this valve here is the manual valve. Yeah, so the suggestion is to prevent steam getting in there. So that's there already, yeah. You choose? A bypass of the feed coming into the reactor. Okay, and then so that bypass would be opened automatically based on pressure. Based on pressure. So here maybe a pressure sensor added and controls the bypass flow to prevent any new A species A from being added into the reactor. Is what you're saying. Okay. Mark, that's great. I think it might be maybe more conventional than realistic, but like having like a second kind of coolant that like if your initial coolant is not being enough, then you could also add that to your stream. Okay, so have excess coolant capacity to prevent that, um, or to ensure that you've got enough coolant. That could be there. like a fail open valve that would just kind of automatically happen. Okay, what if, what if I said let's just, uh, we could go size that coolant to be larger, right? Yeah. So make sure that your coolant is always, is, exceeds the possibility of that. Okay, so it would swamp out the steam, essentially in this case. Yeah. Okay, other suggestions? Clear? Okay. Okay, so alarm on the steam valve. Now you'd have to turn that alarm off during startup to get the system started up. But alarm on the steam, val steam valve or flow of steam, okay? So if, the, if there is flow of steam that someone knows about it. Other suggestions?
Okay, so T on uh, coolant stream into reactor with T A H, so temperature alarm high. Yeah. SIS system triggered based on uh, on high temperature or pressure? pressure? Pressure. Okay, so SIS system on high pressure to shut steam. Okay, and you probably want to consider that SIS not only shutting steam but also shutting feed. Okay, to shut steam. and to shut feed. Okay, so we could go, and this is what we should be doing, going down every one of those suggestions actually triggered one of these. We could go address this problem with the basic process control system, with alarms, or with SIS, and we could have even put on relief, right? So right now, we don't have relief on here. So we could have that relieved. We could look at SIS, as was just suggested, suggested alarms, and basic process control. All, what, all of those four could have been used to try and mitigate the issue. We could have done something a little bit better as well, or at least looked in, at investigating it. And that is trying to avoid and make the process intrinsically safe. Any suggestions on what I mean by that? You add a couple of lines in the PLC code so that the system can't go on unless you're through it. Okay, add a few lines in the PLC code so that steam can never go on unless you're in startup mode. That's called an interlock. Okay, so you create a small loop that prevents steam from ever being used in that, in that case. Okay. Anything else that we could use to make the process intrinsically safe? Other suggestions? Yeah, clear. Maybe have the leftover layer dried up the whole time on the one that is not heat on my steam layer. Okay, so never have steam here. Heat preheat the reactants in some other way so that you don't have to have the steam line coming into the reactor. Okay, so eliminate the cause entirely from that particular vector. What about investigating a catalyst that could avoid this intermediate reaction? So we've got this intermediate reaction occurring that goes on to form D and E. Is there maybe an alternative chemistry or an alternative catalyst that we can go straight to our final products without this intermediate stage causing that increase in pressure, right? Investigate an entirely alter different alternative. You could also look at adding excess B. So if you have excess B, ensure that you've got lots of B around so that it can react with C and keep driving that reaction forward. Okay, if you've got a high temperature problem here, you've got your kinetics being faster accelerate the consumption of your problematic species and, and try to consume your product of that intermediate away. Okay? So, look, so there's some other alternatives to investigate, not just with process control, alarms, and SIS. Okay? And that's what I want you to get from this analysis. Now we're going to look at hazard and operability studies. And I'm going to give a fairly brief overview of it. It's um, something that you've already done in the assignment. And what I'm going to look at is slide 14 in the notes to illustrate the principle.
Okay. So hazard and operability studies are, if you ever go into a company and you have the opportunity to do one, you almost certainly will because none of your colleagues will want to do it. It's just one of those things that everyone groans and it's like, this uses up a whole day of my time. Um, it's boring. It's tedious. But the operability, hazard and operability studies I've been involved on, I learned far more about the process during those eight, eight hours than I did from anyone else. Because what you do when you get a, a hazard and operability team together is you're bringing experts from all across the company. Operators, quality control, engineers, and it's not just chemical engineers there, there's civil, mechanical, electrical engineers. All of these experts in the room bringing their angle, bringing their perspective on the problem. So you're seeing an integrated view of the process from multiple angles. So this is why you'll be in a hazard and operability study, because if you're one of the few chemical engineers in your company, you'll be asked to be representing the chemical engineering perspective. Okay, so we, we do this as a team, and we work through the process flow sheet in a systematic way. Now, let's just go to a, a messy flow sheet so you don't have to in your notes, but here's one you have seen before. How would you even do a hazard and operability study on this level of complexity? Is it, it's, it's more than a single day, of course. And what we, the typical approach is, is to work with the flows. So from left to right, we'll find our entry point and we'll work along from left to right and we'll go from node to node to node. And at each node, we will investigate it in a systematic way. So when we so talk about nodes, it is very specifically defined. So it might be, for example, here at the pump has a T splitting out to two parts of the process. We could be looking at one node being one of the junctions going to the next unit. You saw there in the assignment how very specifically I defined the node for you. It was the part from the pump to the inlet of the fired heater. That's one node. Your next node might be the pipe inside the fired heater carrying the products. Your next node might be the pipe leaving the fired heater going into the reactor. Right? So it's, it's a very specific location on your flow sheet and it can involve the physical equipment or even the pipes themselves as, as is often done. Once you've selected your node, you will then consider parameters on that node that make sense. So parameters would be flow, temperature, level. So level of course doesn't make sense in a pipe, right? But level makes sense if your node is a tank. So flow, temperature, level, pressure, composition, even Things like operator actions are valid types of parameters. Uh, let, me, let me just talk a bit about that. So an operator action might be to take a sample of the process or manually investigate the sensors. The, the operator's job might have an action of manually investigating the sensors. And so we can consider that as a node, that corrosion, viscosity, any number of these parameters can be considered. So you've got your node, then you're going to iterate through multiple parameters, picking out parameters that make sense for your node. So you can see how combinatorial this is and why this is more than a few hours to even has up a simple process. And once you've picked up your parameter, then you're going to pose some guide words that are relevant to that parameter. So you're going to look at deviations. Your guide words can be, um, can be of several types. I'll just show you an example here of one of them. If we consider the node to be the pipe after the pump and after the splitter, the parameter we might consider is flow rate. So we've got our node, we've got our parameter, and the guide word I might select is less. Okay, so there's a whole table of guide words here on the next page. No, no or none, more or less, as well of, reverse, other than. So not all of these make sense for flow, but one that does make sense for flow is less. More, no, reverse, those four make sense for flow. We're going to start with less flow. And once you've selected your node, parameter, and guide word, then we always look at this sequence shown here by the bullet points. 
So if your deviation is less flow than normal, what might cause that? And this is where the whole group of people start to creatively look at the process and say, what could be the cause of lower than normal flow? And as the chemical engineer, you might isolate the pump as one example, that the coupling between the motor and the pump is broken, so the pump is actually not providing uh, the, the flow required, or a blockage in the pipe that's providing lower than normal flow. Other people there might have different I ideas for the cause. Once those are collected, you look at the consequences. And that was what we did um, a little bit here when we looked at this high pressure example. The consequence could have been explosion, but the consequence might also have been um, material being forced out of the reactor due to the high pressure. So not that as drastic as explosion, but still a pretty dramatic consequence. And you'd look at that consequence as a result of the prior cause that you've investigated. And once you've done that, you look at actions to take. And that was what we also looked at in the prior example. Which actions can you take to eliminate that chain of events from the deviation going to the accident? Okay, so you can see why engineers don't like to spend their time doing this. This seems like the worst possible thing to be doing during your day, okay? Is coming up with ideas of why these accidents occur, uh, sorry, why these deviations occur, what are the consequences, and how can you improve the process, right? Because what's going through your mind is like, they're never going to listen to my idea, right? That's a valid one. The other one is like, people around the table selecting causes that might never ever occur. So they're looking at ideas that are far beyond the realm of practical um, occurrence. And so everyone's sitting there like thinking this is such a waste of my time. Now regardless of some of those excessive causes like so planes flying into your building or people doing uh, things that you know are likely not to happen we still do need to take a, a critical look at that sequence of events. And what we'll find is, if you do this on one of the deviation uh, guide words, you'll typically find when you look at, at some of the others that the same chain of events occurs, right? So it's not quite as tedious as it appears. When we've looked at that parameter flow rate and then the guide word less, the next approach is to look at the guide word of more. And then the next approach is to look at the guide word of no flow. Then the next one is to look at reverse flow. What you'll typically look at, even though you've looked at it four times, what you'll typically find is that the actions you take to prevent less flow are going to be the same actions that you would take to prevent no flow. Right? So there's a lot of overlap between this. It's not, it goes a little bit quicker as soon as you get into the, the process. Okay, so. Let's give that a try ourselves here. I'm going to ask you to work on this particular case study. Okay, so let's take a look at it. It's a fired heater and we're feeding air and fuel, very similar to the assignment question. But the node I'd like you to consider here in this particular example is the air flow to the heater. Okay, so we're the node I'm going to select is just this piece of pipe from the compressor before it joins the fuel line. Okay, so just that node. And I'd like you to consider the parameter. We'll start with an easy one. So your node is the pipe for air. The parameter I'd like you to consider is flow. And the deviation I'd like you to consider is no flow. Okay, so when you're looking at that, the next set of sequence to follow is what are the causes, what are the consequences, and how would you improve this, the process? So take a, a few minutes to discuss that causes of no flow, the consequences of no flow, 
and how you might mitigate that problem. Um, so uh, maybe one, I didn't address this, but we will typically do this pre-construction. So you'd be having the PNIDs in front of you before built. Uh, though it is possible to HAZOP, and it is often done, you have um, sort of biannual or triannual HAZOPs being done. So of an as-built process already, yeah. Okay, so let's hear some causes, potential causes of no flow. Yeah. The valve for the air intake is stuck in the closed position. Okay, so that's a potential cause. Steven, sorry? This pipe is broken. Okay, so that pipe breaks. The valve or the pump is fouled, and would that lead to no flow or low? Yeah, it's just bad enough, I guess. It would kind of be like a blockage. A blockage, okay. So uh, a blockage in the valve or the pipe, okay. Like a power outage. A power outage, okay. So your motor or compressor there disappears um, from operation. Or the coupling between the motor and the compressor breaks so, so that you're not receiving that energy to compress the air anymore. The pressure in the heater is too high and then essentially creating just at the right amount so you get no flow of air coming in. Okay, unlikely though as you say. Okay, so all of those are, are valid causes. Pipes breaking are... Um, relatively low occurrence from natural causes, but someone driving their forklift into it is not um, uncommon. So that could work um, as, as potential causes. Consequences of no flow. No heating, okay. Other co consequences, so the air is gone. The natural gas, this fuel line still is pumping fuel into the fired heater. Okay, let's build up on that particular vector. What would happen next then? So you got fuel building up in the react in the fired heater. Someone else? Yeah. Okay, you could have an explosion, or there's going to be some leakage through that fired heater. So you are going to get some form of air in there and and start to explosively ignite that fuel source. Okay, so the fuel valve is open. These fired heaters are not um, totally insulated, right? There's, there's gaps in there and air can leak in and, and set off as an ignition source. Yeah, Mark? Okay, so emissions of the fuel outside but, but then leading to the same outcome. Yeah, Jerris? Okay, so that would be the very initial, if that air stops flowing, initially you just form carbon monoxide, but then later on, because you've got no air to support combustion, there's no, um, no CO being formed. But it, that would be a perfect example for, for low flow. Okay, so if you were looking at the deviation of low flow of air, that would be the formation of carbon monoxide. Okay, okay so actions to take. Suggestion actions, yeah. Okay, so if there's no flow 
of air, we have an interlock to shut off fuel. So again, those few lines of PLC code detect a minimum amount of airflow. If that's not met, shut down the fuel flow. Other suggestions? Ensure that valve fail open. Ensure the valve, the air valve fails open. Put your pipes where forklifts won't drive into them. Okay. So that's always why our piping is up on the racks. Well, not the only reason why, but um, right. So we have that off and away from disruption. Nicole. Okay. If this was essential to operation, have, ensure that you have some fail mechanisms so that if power fails, there's still air there. Okay. Again, have an interlock so that if the power does fail, that you cut everything off. Okay, so if the power fails, have the fuel valve fail shut and the air valve fail open. Okay, there's also a safety interlock that you could put on um, the system. So a safety interlock that will measure the fuel flow and if it's, uh, sorry, the air flow, if it's not at the required level, shut the fuel, sh open the air. Okay, so there's a number of actions then that you would take on that. Some are more costly than others. Okay. So that's the idea with hazard and operability studies. Um, what I'll do is in Dr. Marlin's chapter five, I'll post the reference. The, well, the reference is posted on the course website. In fact, all the solutions for the assignment you did are in that chapter already, if you, if you weren't sure of that. This case study comes from there, and I'll point you to some more examples of hazard.